Now, let's revisit what Homer says. There is a certain Nisa, mountain high, with forests thick of cedar, in Phoenicia afar, close to Egypt's streams. Herodotus also claims that only two gods worshipped by the Arabians in the Sinai region are Dionysus and Aphrodite. Throughout the Old Testament, Dionysian imagery is everywhere. The temple built by Solomon is described as having golden vines wrapped in ivy with clusters of golden grapes and golden satyrs, serim, goat men, decorated the inner sanctum. Satyrs and vines with ivy and grape clusters is a combination that makes Dionysian imagery impossible to ignore. Dionysus himself is depicted as a satyr with horns, and he leads an army of satyrs into battle, and they wear crowns of ivy. Many Roman and Greek authors also thought that the Jews worshipped some form of Dionysus, and I will revisit this matter when I talk about the Asian Dionysus known as Sabasius. A passage from the Chaldean oracles reads, Dionysus or Bacchus was called by the Chaldeans Ya'o in the Phoenician tongue and is frequently called Saboeth, such as the one who is above the seven poles called Demiurge. In the Nabataean kingdom, the counterpart of Dionysus was the great god named Dushara or Dusaris, the one of Shara, from the name of the mountain overlooking Petra in Arabia. Dushara was expected to bring justice if called by the correct ritual. Epiphanius of Salamis writes about Dushara as being born of a virgin named Kabu, equated to that of the underworld queen Persephone. This is interesting because the Dionysus of the Black Sea region was born of Kubaba, later known as Kaibali and she was often equated with Persephone as well, and this will come up later in the video. The reason why we know Dushara was associated with Dionysus is because he also had a temple in southern Italy that was used until the first century. He is depicted in his normal robes holding the Thrysus staff that Dionysus holds. Dionysus is also considered by Herodotus, Diodorus, Dionysus of Helicarnassus, Strabo, as well as the Orphic and Homeric hymns, to be an equivalent of the Egyptian god Osiris. More on this later as well. All of these factors show us that the Dionysian religion of the Bronze Age was so widespread that it was arguably practiced in some shape or form worldwide to all cultures that cultivated the vine. Some ancient authors, like Nonus, think he was even worshipped as far as lands beyond India to the east, and Posidinus of Rhodes tells a story about a group of Bacchant women living all the way west on an island in the Atlantic Ocean that lived in a matriarchal society and only worshipped Dionysus. According to Posidonus, they send virgins to the mainland once a year to get pregnant. If a male is born, they chant Eva and tear apart and eat them as baby Dionysus was torn apart and eaten by titans. And if it's a female, she is raised as a bacchant. The evidence clearly shows that the Dionysian cults were known throughout the entire ancient world. The other possible origins of Dionysus, his Sabasian roots of the Black Sea Caucasus region, another ancient kingdom that thrived in the Copper Age, is even more interesting and compelling. Current findings indicate that the initial cultivation of vines occurred in the Southern Caucasus, now known as Georgia, around 6000 BCE, and subsequently in the 5th millennium BCE, brought to the Sumerians in what is now southern Iraq. Additionally, it was the Phoenician traders who transported the initial vines from these regions to their land, present-day Lebanon, facilitating the advancement and production of wine. According to the Bible, Noah 
was the first winemaker. His ark stranded, as the Bible claims, about 5,000 years ago on Mount Ararat, an area in this exact region where the vine cultivation was discovered. Evidence of a vine god in the form of Sabasius was considered as the most ancient and most revered among Cappadocians and Phrygians who also venerated the great mother, Kybele. It is thought that Sabasius and Kybele are husband and wife. There is archaeological evidence of this dating to 6000 BCE in the form of Kubaba. I will speak more on this later in the video, but the fact that the wine and grape cultivation was discovered in this region gives much plausibility to the possibility that a wine god would also be first venerated here. According to Cicero, there was at least five different Dionysus traditions, as he states in On the Nature of the Gods, written in the first century BCE in Latin. We have several bearers of the name Dionysus. The first is the son of Jupiter and Proserpina. The second, who is said to have slain Nisa, is the son of the Nile. The third is the son of Cabiris. He is reported to have been king over Asia, and in his honor, the Sabazia were instituted. The fourth is the son of Jupiter and Luna, and it is in connection with him that the Orphic rites are believed to be celebrated. The fifth is the offspring of Nisus and Thyone, and the supposed founder of the Triturides. The common story about Dionysus is that he is the offspring of Zeus and Semele, who is a daughter of Cadmus and the king of Thebes. Hera, the consort of Zeus, driven by envy, manipulated the expecting Semele to validate the divine nature of her lover by having him reveal his true self. Zeus, adhering to her request, manifested in his true form, but his immense power was too overwhelming for the mortal Semele, leading to her destruction by thunderbolts. However, Zeus managed to rescue his son by enclosing him in his thigh until he could mature, rendering Dionysus as being born twice. Subsequently, Dionysus was entrusted to the care of the Bacchants, also known as Maenads, a locale considered to be fictional under the guidance of the deity Hermes. However, his twice-born title also has more to it than that. There are other legends of Dionysus that are said to predate this tale in the mystery cults of ancient Greece, passed down through fragments of Orphic hymns, kept secret his true origins as Zagreus, the divine child of Persephone and Zeus, who was chosen to be the king of the universe in succession after Kronos and Zeus. Although, just after he was born, Zagreus, the baby Dionysus, was torn to pieces, cooked, and eaten by the evil titans. But his heart was saved by Athena, and he, Dionysus, was resurrected by Zeus through Semele. Zeus struck the titans with lightning, and they were consumed by fire. From their ashes came the first humans, who thus possessed both evil nature of the titans and the divine nature of the gods. The central tale of Orphism revolves around Dionysus' torment and demise by the Titans and eventual resurrection. This narrative in Orphic thought highlights the dual essence of humans, a bodily aspect derived from the Titans and a divine essence or soul from Dionysus. For liberation from the material world tied to the Titans, one needed to be inducted into the Dionysian rites and experience telete, a ceremonial cleansing that involved re-experiencing the god's anguish and demise. Orphix held the conviction that after passing away, they would eternally coexist with Orpheus and other legendary figures in Elysium, a kingdom in Hades ruled by Saturn. Conversely, they thought those who weren't initiated would face endless cycles of reincarnation. 
Orpheus was a high priest of Dionysus and has multiple hymns to Dionysus and Sabasius attributed to him. Orpheus was said to have given his adepts secret wisdom that they can bring to Hades upon passing away that will allow them to be saved from the cycles of reincarnation and death. This is the hymn of memory when you are about to die. You will go to the spacious halls of Hades. A spring is on the right, and by it stands the bright cypress tree. There the descending souls of the dead refresh themselves. Do not go near to this spring at all. Further on, you will find from the lake of memory, refreshing water flowing forth. But guardians are nearby. They will ask you with sharp minds what you seek in this misty shadow of Hades. Say, I am the child of earth and starry heaven, Gaia and Aranos, and I am parched with thirst and I perish. But quick, give me refreshing water to drink from the lake of memory. And then they will speak to the underworld king, Pluto. And then they will give you the drink from the lake of memory. And you, having drunk, will go along the sacred road that the other famed initiates in Bacchix travel. An Orphic initiate who followed these directions would pass into heaven and be saved. The Orphic's focus on piety and salvation from death heavily influences later Pythagorean, Platonist, and Judeo-Christian theologies that came after. 